Mike, I'm an alcoholic. Yeah. Yeah, it's a big room. Yeah, you guys are right. Um, had most of you to the back of me, which was the way to start. So, um, start out with sort of the preliminaries. So, um, my sobriety date is October 23rd, 2010. Um, I do have a home group. It's the Willow Springs group, um, not in Willow Springs, in Fuquay. Um, um, we meet on Sunday evenings. Um, we have a beginners meeting and a big book study that run concurrently at 7 p.m. And then we have a speaker meeting on Thursday nights at at 8 o'clock. Um, it's a great home group. Um, been there for several years now, and I think we do a really good job of um, staying in the solution and, and being a really well-structured three legacy group. So, um, I do have a sponsor. Um, who has a sponsor? Who has a sponsor? And I sponsor um, a couple of gentlemen in, uh, in AA as well. So I think that's, I think I hit all my qualifiers there. Um, so I'll uh, just get right, right into it. I'm telling you what it was like, what happened, and what it's like now. So I was born in um, Charlottesville, Virginia, and um, was not raised in an alcoholic household where there was really no drinking in the house, but there was sort of the specter of alcoholism, um, just because my, my mom and my dad had divorced before I can remember. I was around, but I don't remember. It. Um, and so it was always sort of, Growing up, I always was just sort of told, well, you know, dad drank a lot, right? Like, and, you know, eventually it was dad was an alcoholic, things like that. But I didn't really know what that meant. I had no memory of, of any of that. Um, but it was just sort of, you know, I guess I was older when I really even started to, to hear that kind of thing. So for, for years, I just didn't really have any experience with alcohol growing up. Um, I remember as a kid, occasionally I'd see my mom have a fuzzy navel. Like for some reason, the very specific memory I have is being at Chi Chi's and my mom had a fuzzy <laughs> navel and me not really understanding what that was and like I mean, she never drank. So it was just very bizarre to me. I didn't really understand it. But um, I keep wanting to like make edited out jokes because this thing, this thing's here. So if I say anything wrong, I might go edit it out. But um, you'll be able to go back and cut that out. Um, so growing up, it wasn't an alcoholic household, but I remember feeling that it was a dysfunctional household. Like early on, before I probably had any understanding of like what dysfunctional meant. Um, I mean, you always hear speakers talk about feeling different. Um, I mean, I remember as a kid. I don't know what age, but I remember the word dysfunctional being in my head and feeling like my family was that. Um, there was sort of that feeling of, of difference. You know, um, I looked at other people's families and I felt like they had like, um, I remember I had a friend who I felt like his family was like the, the Cleavers. Like they were, they just seemed perfect and like they never argued or, and I'm sure they did, right? But they, on the face of it, they just seemed absolutely perfect. and. My family seemed like chaotic in comparison, so I just remember um, just feeling different with that. Um, I would say it wasn't really that chaotic in hindsight and, and getting some sobriety. I look back, I'm like, it, I mean, every family has some level of dysfunction, but I don't think it was as special as I thought it was um, at the time. Um, so I did well through school. Um, you know, where things kind of started to change was um, high school for me. So uh, I was actually probably more like late middle school. So in that, that period, um, my mom's second marriage dissolved and um, there's a lot of stuff that kind of came out as a part of that um, that really kind of rocked the entire sort of family dynamic. And um, it kind of just turned all of our worlds upside down. And I remember my response to that was, um, you know, my mom wanted to go, wanted me to go to therapy and wanted me to, to, you know, talk about my feelings and things like that. And my response was, leave me alone, I'm fine. And I, I just ran away. So I didn't drink yet. Um, I, alcohol wasn't even on my radar, but I think it's indicative of kind of what alcohol became for me, which was a means of escape and running away from things. Um, I spent most of my high school years, I would go to school and I would come home and I would go in my room and you didn't see me for the rest of the night. Like, I, 
I was just complete hermit. Um, and, and I liked it that way, or at least, you know, I thought I did. Um, to the point, actually, this is funny, I used to wear pajama pants under my pants to school so that when I got home, it was like, bam, relaxation, going right to my room. I thought it was the most efficient thing I could possibly do. But, um, um, yeah, so alcohol wasn't really on my radar there. But what, I, what started to happen around that time frame was my older sister started to drink. And she started to, um, I think she was, you know, self-medicating, I guess, you know, at the time, but, you know, she started drinking and, you know, that was sort of her way of coping with the, the chaos that was going on in our family. And I remember thinking that, I, I mean, frankly, I thought she was weak. Like, I, somehow I thought my approach to things running away was better. I thought she was weak for trying to um, rely on alcohol um, to deal with the, the situation. So I, I looked down my nose at her for for a couple of years there in high school where I just thought, you know, she's, I can't believe she's using that as a crutch and she'd get in trouble and I just, you know, I wasn't ever going to do that was kind of my stance. I, somehow or another I thought I was, I thought it was okay, like, right? So I thought I was just super strong and I was totally fine and I really wasn't. But um, then uh, when I was about 17, I was still in high school and uh, this same older sister, I, I have to say, like, I was always terrified of her. Um, and uh, she could always get me to do whatever she wanted me to do for the most part. So um, I remember as a kid, she would beat up on me. And my uncle one time said, you know, one day he's going to pop you back. Um, and we're still waiting for that. I, I know that. <laughs> so uh, never, never learned that lesson. But... Um, Anyway, I was 17 years old, and um, I remember she just burst into my room one day and, and said, come take a shot with me. And again, I was terrified of her, so I was just like, okay. So I <laughs> went over to, her room was next door to mine, and I don't remember what was going on. She'd had a rough day or whatever, but she didn't want to drink by herself. So um, she poured, I remember I had a Dr. Pepper to chase with, and she poured a shot of Everclear. Um, it's a good way to start, right? Um, actually, Everclear is illegal in Virginia, too, so it was like smuggled Everclear. It was like extra dangerous. Um, so I took the shot of Everclear, chased it with Dr. Pepper, and got out of there as fast as I could. Because, I mean, again, I was terrified of my sister. I really only did it because I was just terrified of her. Um, and I'll say, like, that wasn't a big white light experience. I remember feeling... Um, it tasted terrible. I mean, I remember that. And I remember just feeling like really, really warm. Um, like I remember sort of that warm feeling. But it wasn't sort of like, oh, wow, this feels great. I'm going to do this again. Um, but what I think it, it did do for me at that point was sort of break down that wall of like, you know, up until that point, I was just staunchly, I'm not going to drink, right? But then faced with the, the fear of my sister, I drank, no, no questions asked. And I think that kind of broke down that, uh, that barrier a little bit for me uh, because it wasn't long after that that I really started to, to drink and it was more social that I would drink at that point. I would drink with friends, um, you know, parties at, at friends' houses, things like that. Normal teenage drinking, I would say, at that point. Um, what I started to kind of notice, though, was in some situations, you know, I, I always wanted to get drunk. So, I mean, very early on, I didn't have a, an understanding of sort of what's the line and where to, where to stop. And at a lot of parties and things, that was okay, because no, none of us did, right? So I, I could kind of justify that. But I remember getting drunk one time. Um, whenever I give, my, give a talk, I feel like I'm, I'm not throwing my older sister under the bus. She just was a part of it for a little while there. So <laughs> I was getting drunk with her one night and um and i just i got plastered i got so drunk and did some other things that night um because i just didn't have any inhibitions whatsoever and i remember the next day i loved it like i felt horrible the next day but i still loved it i think that was the first time i really really got drunk and the next day my sister like 
had sat me down and had a talk with me about my drinking. Like she was concerned. <laughs> like this is, you know, first time I really, really, like I, I've probably been drunk, but not. I mean, this was like blackout, not a good, good situation, and and I loved it, and I think she saw I loved it, but I didn't, you know, I didn't hear anything she said when she, when she, you know, sat me down and said, "Hey, I'm worried about you." Like that wasn't. She basically said, "I didn't. I don't think the way you drank last night was normal." And, um, and I was just sort of like, well, whatever, like, who are you to talk, right? So I just immediately wrote it off and um, didn't, yeah, just didn't give any, any credence to it. So following that, I, um, I kind of just kept drinking socially for a little while, um, off and on. And then I, I got involved with a, a girl, and she was, she was pretty religious and um, didn't really approve of drinking. So um, I drank a little while while I was with her, but eventually she kind of said, look, you know, I don't, don't like it, and, and I stopped, right? The big book talks about there may have been those points in our, our life where we could have stopped, um, and, and we, you know, we, maybe, we, maybe somehow that could have been the end of it, right? Like, I was able to stop at that point without really any trouble. But I'll say, when she decided to kind of shed her, her religious leanings and wanted to kind of spread her wings and go wild a little bit um you know suddenly it was okay to drink again and i didn't have any hesitation about that so i was like this is great um i don't remember how long it was um but yeah kind of i waited till you know she wanted to to go wild a little bit and then i went right back to, to drinking but again even then it was it was fairly social um i would say when i was 20 i was in college and I moved in with somebody who was 21 years old, and that's when it really became a daily thing because I didn't. Um, there, was, there was just the way I looked at it. There's no stopping it, right? Like the, the person I lived with had no problem buying, you know, whatever alcohol I wanted. Um, so that's really when it became a daily thing. And I was going to college, and I was working about 30, 35 hours a week, but I still managed to get in plenty of plenty of time to drink, and. Um, that was also the point in my drinking where I started to have times where I thought maybe it was a problem or, or it was getting problematic. Um, like I started doing things like trying to limit myself and say, okay, I get off of work tonight at nine, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna say I, I can have three beers tonight. And I would stick to that three beers, but I also realized if I drink them really fast, I get more out of them. So like I was constantly sort of playing with this formula of I don't want to go too far, but you know, I want to. I still want want that feeling, right? I want that that ease and comfort from from it. Um, I even at one point during that time period, after doing something or other that was horribly embarrassing at a party, um, that same girl I, I was still with her, and I remember we were having dinner, and I said, "Yeah, I think I just need to to just stop drinking." Like, um, you know, I, I just I make a fool of myself and. It's just not good. And she was like, well, no, you don't need to stop drinking. Like, you just, you just need to control it. Like, Great point, right? Okay. So um, I kept drinking, and I kept trying to control it. Uh, and that really kind of became um, the goal for me from then on out. Um, and it was, it was a funny thing because the big book talks about, you know, every drinker wants to, to enjoy and control their drinking. And I think the big struggle that I had was I felt sort of this pressure to control my drinking, like societally, right, to, just to be a, a decent person. Um, but when I controlled my drinking, I wasn't enjoying it. And so it was this constant battle of like, if I was really enjoying it, I was just, I was just drinking. So I was always, you know, kind of fighting, fighting that. And it was um, somewhere in that college time frame in this... <clears throat> This is just sort of an example of, of my insanity and my, my desire to control. Um, so this was before like these things um, and you had flip phones, but and my, I had a flip cell phone and I started setting a timer on it that would tell me when I could drink. So like literally if I was in a social situation and I needed to have some level of control, I might have a beer and I'd set this timer to go off every five minutes. <laughs> I'm not kidding. <clears throat> Even that was a struggle, right? Because how big of a gulp do you take at that five minutes? 
right? So it's still it's, it's not an exact science, but um, but I tried to get it to be. And the flip side of that was when I would um, drink by my, when I drink by myself, I'd set that timer for like one or two minutes, right? Because you got to speed it up to try and get get drunk as quickly as possible. Um, and I did that for a while. I mean, I remember being out at bars and people being like, "Are you going to get that?" <laughs> it just it would ring, and I'd try and like subtly. I had like a little snooze button, try and subtly hit it. Thought nobody noticed. Like, no, that's not a phone call. That's my phone telling me I can have another sip. So I did that through um, throughout. That was like later college years, and then um, when I graduated from college, I still don't quite know how I graduated, but I did. Um, and I, I graduated from college and. I think within a month of graduating from college, that girl I'd been dating the whole time, she broke up with me. And we'd been together since I was 18. So, I mean, and I graduated late. So, yeah, I think we'd been together about five years. And when that happened, like, I was just absolutely devastated. I'd sort of had this mindset that, like, she and I, you know, once I got out of college, somebody was just going to hand me a good job. Um, that also didn't happen. Um, but I thought like a good job was just going to fall out of the sky, and I was going to buy a ring, and we were going to get married, and that was going to be that, and happily ever after. So I was, uh, we'd had our issues, but I was still pretty caught off guard. And I remember, um, like that's really when I stopped caring as much. Um, I started hanging around with people who didn't care either, um, and you know just. I just, I, I stopped caring about trying to control it, right? Like the phone thing kind of went away for the most part because it just didn't seem to matter anymore. And um, I think within, well, eventually I did get a decent nine to five job, but I had to move back home with my mom because I had, all, all my roommates had turned into alcoholics and drug addicts and so and they were dropping like flies like uh, you know leave it just went up and leave one day and all of a sudden I don't I'm one roommate short on rent and so finally we had to like break our lease because it was just me and one other guy left and we couldn't afford to pay for for the apartment so I moved back home with my mom and I thought I had a pretty sweet deal because I was uh, not paying any rent I was working a decent nine to five job, so I was able to kind of get into this nice routine of I'd work till five and I'd come home and I'd drink to oblivion. And um, and my mom didn't seem to care either, which was kind of funny. Like, I mean, I'd just get drunk in the house every night. Like, it, I mean, I'm sure she cared, right? But she never said anything. And um, I did that for a while. And I don't know how long I did it before I took the morning drink, but um, at, at a certain point, and I don't even remember what really brought it on, but some, somehow or another the routine turned into, um, I was still primarily a beer drinker at that point, the routine turned into I'd get up about 5 o'clock in the morning and I'd drink three or four beers and then I'd go back to sleep until I had to get up and go to work. And I'd, and I'd go to work get through the day and then I'd come home and I'd drink uh, till I passed out basically. And that was, that was kind of my routine. Um, during this time, I, I just like to share this because I always hear people say like, oh, I used to go to different liquor stores and you know, didn't want them to know. I, I, that never occurred to me. I went to the same gas station every day and bought a case of beer. Like just never occurred to me that they might be going, wow, like what is this guy doing? Um, didn't cross my mind. But um, I did that for a while, and at a certain point, I think mentally I was just going downhill. Like, I wasn't happy anymore. Um, I hadn't been happy really in a while. But I also, you know, getting drunk was something that I was just doing, right? Like, I, I was kind of telling myself that it made me feel better, but it wasn't really making me feel better anymore. Um, you know, I'd still get drunk, but it would just, it'd be a depressed drunk. And um, so after a little while, I, I started to um, feel suicidal. And I remember there was one day where I woke up and I just felt really, really, I felt like I was going to do it. Like I was just going to take a bunch of pills. And fortunately, I didn't. And I reached out for help, um, called my mom. 
and um, was like, I need to, I need to get myself on track. But I didn't really do anything at that point. So I, I AA wasn't in the picture. Um, I don't. I assume I knew about it. I guess like maybe from TV or whatever. But um, it wasn't really on my mind. I, I remember I moved into my grandmother's house and. <clears throat> I um, started going to therapy, and I thought that was going to be kind of my fix. A new environment, go to therapy, and I'll be okay. Um, but I think within a week of moving into her house, probably even before that first therapy appointment, <laughs> um, I was drinking again. Um, and I, it was just that desperation, too, because there was no alcohol in her house. It was like the only thing I could find was vanilla extract. Um, which is not good, um, but I mixed it with Coke and tried to make the best of it. But, um, and shortly thereafter, I thought I figured it out because I was, I, I kind of, because I was hiding it at that point from my grandmother, right? And so my, my new routine came, it came to be that she'd go to bed about 9.30 or 10 o'clock, at which point I would drink. So, you know, I made sure to sneak in whatever I needed to sneak in after work. And then when she went to bed, I drank till I passed out, and that was my new routine. I thought that was a pretty safe routine. You know, we're talking, I mean, I'd probably be passed out in a couple of hours, so it was a couple of hours of drinking a day. I thought, that's pretty good. And um, ended up moving back home with my mom and not telling anybody that this is what I was doing, and um, did that for about a year. And then somehow or another, that, that morning drink snuck back in, and I... Um, started at this point I wasn't doing beer anymore it was primarily liquor just because I didn't have to I didn't care whether liquor was room temperature or not and um, and it was easier to hide one bottle than a bunch of bottles so I was doing that for a while and um, somehow that morning drink snuck in again and I um, so I was getting up the same kind of routine I'd get up like five o'clock in the morning and I'd take a couple of shots and um, and then go back to sleep for you know 30 minutes, 45 minutes before I get up and get ready to go to work. And again, I got pretty miserable pretty quick. And then there was, um, you know, and it's funny, like I was very miserable. And in hindsight, I was so obviously miserable, but I really, really did a, a good job for a while trying to convince myself that I wasn't like, um, you know, I'd convinced myself that, like, I was just as happy as a clam when it got to be 10 o'clock at night, and I'd, I'd go to my room like I was Cinderella, and, you know, just, I mean, that clock struck 10, I was like, good night, going to bed, and I wasn't going to bed, I was going to my room to, to drink, and, um, but I, like, that I thought was, like, the happiest part of the day, you know, in hindsight, I look back, and it wasn't, but I just, I just needed to not, to not feel and so that, that's what I looked forward to. And um, so finally, what ended up happening was I did that, that kind of round, so, you know, drink in the morning, go to work. Um, I do other things before that 10 o'clock Cinderella time, and then I drink. And I won't, you know, get into other stuff because this is AA. Um, but I did, I'll just say, like, I did whatever I could to not feel throughout the day. And... Um, but I also, like, alcohol was what I really wanted, and, and um, but I, that was, like, the one thing that I felt like I had to hide, um, and so I did. But anyway, so where it ended up was I woke up, it was, it was a Friday morning, woke up, went through my normal routine of having a few shots, and um, I guess I overshot the mark um, that morning, because I, I, I don't know, like, it, it seems extra hazy, um, and I, I had no, like, plans, so, like, there was no, so before I had kind of started to get suicidal, and it was, like, it was in my head, right, like, it was, I was depressed, and I was suicidal, and it was just there. Um, I think I was depressed at that point, but I, I hadn't had any thoughts of suicide, but that morning, I, you know, took, got drunk, and decided, I don't know if it, <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know what went through my head, to be honest with you. But I, I ended up grabbing a bunch of uh, sleeping pills um, from, I think, 
I think they were my sister's prescription. But it was just a bottle of uh, trazodone, and I took a whole bunch of those. And um, I think I even wrote a note. I, I, I kind of remember writing a note. Um, I never seen it, so I'm sure whoever found it got rid of it. But um, laid down. I was just done. And um, after I don't know how much time, I wasn't done apparently because instead of just drifting off peacefully, which is what I thought was going to happen, um, all of a sudden, like my heart just started like pounding, 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 pounding. And then it was like, I guess that was a little bit sobering um, because all of a sudden I was like, oh no, what if, what's happening? What have I done? And because um, I honestly don't think I, I don't, you know, you talk, people talk about cries for help and things like that. I, I, I think for me that's probably what it was. Uh, I didn't have any real desire to, to die, um, but, I, but I also didn't want to keep doing what I was doing, and I didn't, I didn't know what, what other choices there were. So I, anyway, like, my heart started pounding and um, called out. Unfortunately, my brother and my sister um, were in the house, and they called an ambulance, and off to the hospital we go. And I remember when we were waiting for the ambulance, they were like trying to kind of um, talk to me and everything. And I'm like blubbering, I've been drinking the whole time. And they were going, yeah, we knew. You know, here I thought I was so sneaky, so smart. They're like, we knew, we just didn't know what to do about it. Like they knew what was going on the entire time. So off we go to the hospital and um, they didn't pump my stomach or anything. I don't know if I just didn't take enough. The heart thing, it turned out, trazodone at really high doses, like it, it can have a, a really bad impact on your heart. So like they had me on like an EKG for a few days and um, they didn't, I, yeah, I don't know why they didn't have to pump my stomach, but they, they didn't, I guess that, that's good. And um, so I spent a few days in the hospital on suicide watch and you know, at that point, I was feeling pretty low and feeling pretty desperate. And I remember when it was discharge day, this is something I always think about as kind of, kind of my first step before I knew what the steps were. Um, you know, when you're on suicide watch, they have a sitter in the room with you the whole time. And um, so I had this sitter that day, and it was the day I was, well, I, didn't, I was going to be getting out, but I didn't know that. So I thought I was... It was either I was going to be going home or I was going to be going to the psych ward, but we didn't know yet. And um, But I remember anyway, I was talking to him and he said, you know, as much as you were drinking, it's probably not safe for you to just stop. Like, you're probably going to have to, like, wean off. And I remember just that absolutely terrified me. Um, I didn't know what I was going to do. I didn't know what my options were. But the, but the notion that somehow, like, I was going to just, you know, take four shots today and do that for three days and then take three shots or whatever weaning off looks like um, <laughs> that it just scared me like I just sort of had this notion that like I can't have another drop like you, you can't tell me that I've got to have a little bit like you know for the time being like that's just not going to work um, he was a nice guy um, but fortunately he was not the one with the with the MD so um the, the doctor themselves did not make that recommendation. Um, they did, however, recommend that I spend a week in the psych ward, and um, I was not excited about that. And um, like a good alcoholic, I talked my way out of it. And, um, and I talked my way out of it by basically, I, I told that doctor, I said, I will do whatever you want me to do. Like, I'm ready to, to get my act together. I'm ready to stop drinking. Just tell me what to do but I don't want to go to psych ward. Um, some level of willingness, I guess, um, but not, not enough for the psych ward. And, um, but anyway, they, they elected to, to basically say, okay, well, you're gonna do X, Y, and Z, and they gave me an outpatient treatment center place to call. Um, they gave me very clear steps of, here's what you're gonna do, and, I'm, and the doctor said, I'm gonna call these places to make sure that you're making these phone calls. Um, so there was some level of, of accountability there. And they, they let me go. And the next morning, again, I didn't want to go to the psych ward, but I had some level of willingness. <coughs> so the next morning, I, um, I don't even know if it was willingness at that point. Maybe it was just fear. Um, but the next morning, I called this outpatient treatment center. They told me to call. 
um, kind of told them over the phone what was going on. They said, great, can you be here at 10? We'll, we'll you know, do an assessment. I was like, wow, well, that's really fast, but okay. <laughs> Didn't expect things to move that quickly, but, uh, but I went. We went through the assessment. I don't really remember much of it other than they said, well, you know, well, you can start tonight. Um, and they did, that outpatient treatment center did Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday in the evenings. Um, and they required that you go to three meetings a week at least. And um, so I started, started that group that night. And I think the next day I went to a noon meeting, which was my, my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I was scared to death when I went to that noon meeting because it was about as full as this one is. And it seemed like somehow or another they all knew that I was new. Um, <laughs> all I remember about that meeting was at the end when they got the chips, and I didn't understand anything that was happening. I didn't understand what they were doing with the chips, really. But um, I remember at the end of the meeting, they did the chips and they you know, went through all the chips and they went back to the white chip and said, you know, does anybody need a white chip for any reason? And I'm still just sitting there because I'm like, I don't know I need a white chip. I, don't really, I didn't understand what it was for. I probably just wasn't listening. Um, but then it was like the whole room just like turned around. And like, I, was like, I, think they, I think they know I need to, I guess I'm supposed to get up and do that. So I went up and got a white chip and after the meeting, um, a couple of guys pulled me aside and, and got me a big book and um, they got me a little big book, it's one of those pocket ones. And I had that for like two years of sobriety. I remember my sponsor here in North Carolina, who was so thrilled when I finally got like a, a big, big book. He's like, now you, now you have like a real book. Um, but I had that, that little big book for a while and so they made sure I left with that. And, um, and I was real shy and scared, but I went to meetings. Um, I wasn't super, I wasn't real social with anybody, but I, but I showed up and I did what they, they told me to do. Um, I remember at that outpatient treatment center, it was a five week program. By the end of the five weeks, they, you know, required that you had a sponsor. So not only have I been hearing about it this whole time in AA, but now these people are telling me before you're done, you have to have a sponsor. So I finally, I waited, like, I'm a good procrastinator, so it was like the last week, and I finally went up and asked somebody to be my sponsor. I asked a gentleman, you know, it was one of those meetings where they asked, you know, raise your hand if you're willing to be a sponsor, and he didn't raise his hand, but I still asked him. Um, and he agreed to be my sponsor, and he was a really nice guy, but when I started to work with him, we were, he was, he was very laid back in his approach, I'll say. I'm not going to say it was a bad approach. It was just, it ended up not being my approach. Because I remember when we got to, we kind of just talked through one, two, and three. And then he just sort of said one day, well, when you're ready to do your four step, let me know. And I just remember thinking, if you're not, not going to make me do it. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it, it, that's sort of this thing of like, for me, I, I feel like I've been blessed in that. I do feel like I've had willingness when I really needed willingness, but I also know me, and I do need a kick in the butt sometimes. And I knew that at that point, like, if I didn't have somebody who was kicking my butt, like, I'll drag my feet on that. I, I won't outright refuse, but I'll, I'll drag that sucker out and, and never get it done. So, ended up... Um, asking another guy to, to be my sponsor and um, you know I put a little more thought into it that time this is it was a guy I'd seen speak and he had just moved back to Charlottesville from Arizona he'd lost his job in Arizona he had about 15 years of sobriety and um, he got asked to speak at a meeting and I just remember being struck by the fact that he was absolutely open about the fact that this was the lowest point in his sobriety he was back, you know, 15 years sober, jobless, you know, sleeping on his parents' couch, you know, having to move back to Virginia. He was, he was not in a good spot, but he, at the same time, like, he had a grace about it. Like, he had a positivity. He, he'd admit, you know, like, it wasn't what he would have picked, right? But, like, he, he had some, something that I wanted. Like, I just, I, I looked at it and I said, you know, I want to be able to go through something like that in my sobriety and, and carry myself the same way that, that he carried himself. So I asked him to be my sponsor and, um, and he was much more what I needed, I think. He was, um, 
he was not afraid to kick my butt when my butt needed to be kicked. And, um, and he was also more structured. You know, we, we really sat down and, um, you know, he wasn't a cover to cover, um, sponsor in terms of the big book where we're going to start on page one and we're going to work our way through. And, um, but we were much more in the book as we were working the steps. And when we got to step four, he made sure I did it. Like, you know, he, he, um, to the point where like, I was dragging my feet a little bit. I was, I was working on it, but I, you know, I was dragging my feet. And he finally said, "Well, we're going to do set five on this date, so you got to have it done by then." And that's what I needed was somebody to just say, "This is the deadline," because I can procrastinate anything. And um, I remember step five for me was when I first started to actually feel like I deserved to be here, like like that I actually understood enough of what you guys were talking about. That like, I, start, I guess I started to feel like I was earning my seat a little bit. And, um, but I was also, I remember that step five, I was absolutely terrified. And, um, I remember the whole time we were doing step five, he had a legal pad. He's taking notes. I'm like, what is he taking notes for? Like, I thought this, I was never one to worry too much about confidentiality. Um, it's just, I don't know. I just never worried that much about it. But that, that day I was kind of going, what is he doing with all these notes? Well, you don't need to write that down. Um, and at the end of the, the, when we finally got done, he rips off the page and he hands it to me and he goes, well, these are your character defects. And I realized what he'd been writing the whole time. And, um, you know, I, I, he asked me to do what the, the book said in terms of um, spending some, some quiet time after the fifth step, um, you know, re-reviewing, making sure I hadn't left anything out, um, and then moving forward with uh, the sixth and the seventh step. And then we moved into to amends, and um, you know he helped me to kind of prioritize um, who to make amends to, who who um, maybe the time wasn't right for, um, who not to make amends to at all. You know it's a cliche, but that girl I dated in college, she was top of my list, and he scratched her off that list real quick. Um, he was like, "You're you're you don't you don't need to be going back there." So um, he helped me through that. And we worked through the, the, the rest of the steps, and I was about a, a little over a year sober, and I had um, started to make some friends at work with some folks here in North Carolina. And, you know, started to kind of go, okay, well, I've been sober for a year. Maybe it's, maybe it's time for me to consider a change, something different. So I moved down here to the Raleigh area. My, my company had an office in Charlottesville and in Raleigh, so I moved down here, um, and I thought I was fine to do that, right, because I'd worked all the steps, like, and I was just, you know, I'd come down here and start going to AA here, it'd be no problem, and I came down here, and I'd go to AA meetings, but all of a sudden I was going to, like, maybe one a week, maybe one every other week, I was back to, when I'd show up to a meeting, I was just, I was shy, and I was intimidated, um, I can be outgoing, if, but it, you can kind of tell my comfort level by whether or not I'm outgoing. And I was uncomfortable. And um, I, uh, yeah, so I just, I would show up to meetings. I'd show up right on time and I'd leave as soon as the meeting was over. And I just wasn't, I wasn't getting to know anybody in AA. And I certainly wasn't going enough. And um, around this time I, I started um, dating my my eventual wife, and um, she had been in Al-Anon, and so she used to go to an Al-Anon meeting in Fuquay that happened to have an AA meeting the same night, and that turned out to be the Willow Springs group. So I started going there, it kind of became our Sunday night ritual where she'd go to the Al-Anon meeting and I'd go to the AA meeting. And um, so I started to get a little bit more plugged in, but like I still was really on the outside of that group. Like I wasn't making a whole lot of an effort to get to know anybody there. Um, but I was there more consistently. I would say like that was the positive thing. Um, I also wasn't talking to that sponsor in Virginia and I had not bothered to get a new sponsor in North Carolina. So you can imagine that probably wasn't going in my favor. And um, anyway, I started to notice a lot of old behaviors come up, a lot of dishonesty. I remember at the time I was trying to quit smoking and what, what I was actually doing was hiding smoking. I was still smoking, I was just hiding it. So it was, you know, it was just, it was so reminiscent of the way that I drank and w where I'd been and 
I think had I, 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 I don't think, I know had I continued on that path, I would have drank again. Um, but fortunately, um, by God's grace, I, I had enough. Yeah, he pointed me in the right direction, I guess. Because I remember we, um, my, girl, my wife and I, um, then girlfriend, we were at the beach. We were at Atlantic Beach. And I, you know, again, been on the outskirts, didn't really have a sponsor. I'd started kind of toying around with, like, yeah, I probably should get a sponsor. And um, we were at, the, at Atlantic Beach, and somebody walks in, and it's this guy I know from the Willow Springs group and his wife, you know, two hours away from the group. And, um, you know, he's my sponsor today. But I didn't ask him to be my sponsor then. But I always look back on that as, like, God was sending him, kind of saying, like, here he is. Like, I sent him, I sent him two hours to the beach because you needed him. Um, but I still wasn't, wasn't there yet. It took a little while of being dishonest and miserable before I was finally, like, willing to kind of say, okay, I need to get, get back to basics here. Um, but when I did, he was top of mind. So I reached out to him and asked him to, to be my sponsor, and um, he agreed, and we just started over. Like, we just started right from scratch, and he took me through the steps all over again. Um, you know, his was a, an even more, I would say, book-based approach. He made me do more writing um, than I had to do the first time through the steps, um, and he could not be more different than me. I am laid back. Um, I am kind of a nerd. I'm not, um, I'm certainly not a hunter or a fisherman. Um, and he is all the opposite of that. Like, he's a man's man. He goes hunting. He goes fishing. And he's tried to take me fishing. And he's a patient man, actually. But, um, but we, you know, he, he really just took me through all over again. And, um, and he's, the other thing he really did for me at that point is he got me involved in the Willow Springs group. Uh, again, I'd been going there pretty consistently. And if you've ever been to the Willow Springs group on our Sunday night meetings, we're very structured. Like, we call on people. Um, you know, we, we want to sort of focus on the solution. And sometimes that turns people off that we don't necessarily just open it up. But we call on people because we want people who have experience to share to, to be the ones that are sharing, you know, for the sake of the newcomers that might be in the meeting. And um, I didn't understand that at first. I couldn't, I couldn't figure out why no one ever called on me. <laughs> they did not call on me. Well, because they didn't know who I was. They, didn't, they had no reason to believe I had anything of value to say. Um, I probably didn't have anything of value. Um, but anyway, uh, JR kind of started getting me involved. And he made sure that like, people knew who I was. And he also made sure that I was working that I was, you know, helping to set up the meetings and helping to clean up after the meetings. Um, over time, he helped kind of push me into service. You know, he was doing the hospitals and institutions rep for our group, and when he rolled off of that, uh, we do have elections, but I think that one was rigged. Because uh, <laughs> somehow or another, I, I was the H and I rep after him. But I'm grateful for that, because um, it got me got me into service and then after that um, ended up being the, the GSR for the group for a couple of years. Um, just rolled off of that. Well, I say just rolled off of that, but I rolled <laughs> off in January. Um, but I think that was really valuable, like getting me involved. That group is, that group is very much a, a family to me. Um, my wife and I have even talked about, like, just for pure scheduling reasons, it would be more convenient if my home group were on a different night than Sunday night. I can't bring myself to do anything about that because I, I just love my home group. You know, we've, we've talked about, well, maybe, go, you know, check out some other groups, like really give it some consideration. I just can't do it, you know, certainly not just out of convenience. Um, but yeah, that's, it, that group's just become a, a real family to me. And, um, and that group's also where I started sponsoring. So I, um, I started sponsoring, you know, here and there, but it was never, it never lasted long. Um, they'd always turn around and go back out, and I was getting kind of discouraged, and I'm getting kind of short on time. And um, anyway, I, where I finally, I, I do want to share this because it's been a really important part of, of my recovery. Um, and I think it's, an, it's another one of those God things. Like, I, I was getting discouraged about 
about the whole sponsorship thing. And all of a sudden, this, this guy named Mike went up to JR and asked him to sponsor him. And JR, I think, had like six or seven guys he was sponsoring at that point, and he just said, don't talk to me, go talk to him. And he pointed at me, and um, Mike was the first sponsee that I had that like, um, it worked. Well, he worked, right? Like, he did it. Um, but he was willing to, to go through the steps and, and to, to do what was asked of him. Um, and, you know, that, that was a really gratifying process for me, too. Like, to, to, to actually be able to take somebody through the steps and see their life change. Um, and, you know, his life changed tremendously. It's, it's weird. I still sponsor him to this day, but, like, at this point, like, I look up to him in some ways. Like, he's, he's just... It's amazing what, what he's done, and, and I've sponsored other guys since then, um, off and on, and, and I've got a, another mic right now, so all the mics are clustering in Fuquay, so watch out. Um, but we're, uh, I'm sponsoring another guy named Mike now, and I'm kind of taking him. He's got a few years, but you know he was kind of in the same boat as me where he kind of needed a reset, so we're, we're working our way back through, through the steps again, and Um, And that's, you know, the thing I'm finding with that, too, is, like, it helps keep me accountable. Because if I'm working through the steps with you and I'm asking you to work the steps, it's pretty hard to do that if I'm not doing it. And I'll be honest, like, in my sobriety, I've had lazy periods. I've I've had times where I get complacent. And I think that's where I'm most grateful for sponsees because they they really help make sure that um, I don't get too lazy. Because I have to remember at the end of the day, like, I want to be an example to them in, in sobriety. So, um, you know, my life today is better than I, I could have imagined. You know, I have a wife today. Um, we have uh, no human children, but we have fur children. Um, and I remember when I got sober, after that girl broke up with me in college, like, I was resolved to the fact that I was going to be a bachelor. Like, my, my siblings were all going to get married and have kids, and I was going to be, um, you know, maybe, maybe the goofy, funny uncle, like, who, who never got married, right? Like, that's, that's what I thought I was going to become. And, um, you know, fortunately, that wasn't, wasn't the case. And, you know, I met my wife, and she's stuck with me through a lot of stuff. Um, you know, I, and she helps kind of keep me on track today like you know again if I start getting complacent she'll she'll straighten me out or she'll say you need to call call somebody or you need to go to a meeting or you need to um, you need to do something and she knows enough about the program to know like generally what I need to do and um, although I'll say she also sometimes gets mad because my sponsor will tell me something she's already told me I'll do it when he says <laughs> She doesn't, she doesn't always like that. But, um, I just needed a second opinion, you know? Um, but anyway, I, I've, I'm going on too long, but I really appreciate you guys letting me come out. Kelly, I appreciate you asking me to come out. I'm, I'm grateful to, to be a member of AA, and I'm grateful to, to have the opportunity to, to share my story. So thank you guys. Thank you.